everybody and welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel if you're coming back again. My name is Nikki and you're watching Macabre London. Now tonight I want to do something a little bit different. Now I say tonight, it might be during the day where you are, but <laughs> for me it's tonight. And I wanted to, in the spirit of Halloween, I wanted to record a video that's a little bit different. The reason I wanted to do this is because this is a story that I really like and I just kind of wanted to talk about it and I thought what better time of year to do it than Halloween. Now as you may or may not know I run a podcast called Macabre London which is all about the spooky history of London. Now even though it's called Macabre London I didn't want to really limit myself and just be stuck inside the M25 so <laughs> I decided that maybe we should branch out and start telling some of those stories from around the UK instead. So welcome to the first episode of, don't know whether to call this Macabre UK or Macabre Mini Mysteries. Let me know in the comment box below what you think the best title is for this series. Should we go for Macabre UK or Macabre Mini Mysteries? Let me know. Now, usually for Macabre London, I would sit and read from a script, but actually tonight I thought, why not just tell you the story as it goes? So I've made a few little notes, but I'm pretty much gonna be doing this from memory. So it's gonna be a little bit more relaxed and a bit more chatty than it would be. So if that's not really your thing, then maybe come back for the next episode of Macabre London when I upload that, because it will be back to the scripted format. But otherwise, if you're not too fussy, stick around and let's see how this plays out. So tonight's tale is all about spirits. So before we get started, it's probably a good idea to have some spirits, isn't it? Oh, you can taste the ectoplasm. Okay, so let's get into it. So our tale tonight starts in West Yorkshire, in Pontefract to be precise. Now, Pontefract is a town that's known for a few different things, mainly known for its Pontefract cakes, which aren't actually cakes, they're licorice. I don't know why either, but we'll come back to the licorice in a minute, so keep that in your mind, but we're gonna go elsewhere first. Pontefract has had quite a tumultuous history, and that tumultuous history was mainly inside the walls of its now destroyed castle. Pontefract Castle was known as one of the most impenetrable fortresses of the whole of Yorkshire, and it was known as a bastion of protection of the North. The Norman occupants weren't picky about who they tortured and set up specifically a nasty set of dungeons and anyone who displeased them could find themselves inside, suffering at the hands of the torturers. Locals and royals alike were subjected to all sorts of brutalities within the castle walls and if you were lucky you'd be sent into slavery to serve the people that lived there but if not you were sent down into the dungeon, probably never to be seen again. In fact, in 1399 King Richard II was left to starve to death in the dank basement of the castle proving that nobody was exempt from their cruelty and torture. Later on in the 1400s, the town was constantly attacked during the War of the Roses, the English Civil War, which raged on for 30 years, and it was fought over who had the right to the throne of England. This saw the castle being eventually sieged and then torn down just three days later. And if you've ever watched Game of Thrones, then you might have just recognized some of that story from that, because that's exactly what George R.R. R. Martin ripped off. Did he rip it off or did he take inspiration from it? Mm, he pretty much ripped off most of it. The Northerners will never forget. Yeah, if you go back and read the history of the War of the Roses, it's the plot to Game of Thrones. But I think you'll agree, if it's big enough to make into a uh, seven part, eight part, however many parts Game of Thrones is series, then um, that's one hell of a history for such a tiny place. Now back to the licorice, which I told you I was going to tell you about. When soldiers returned back to Pontefract from fighting in the Crusades, now, for those of you that don't know your history, and um, I'm ashamed to say that I also had to look up exactly what the Crusades were, because I knew a bit, but not a lot. They were religious medieval wars that were fought in the Eastern Mediterranean. And if people survived that and they made their way back to Yorkshire, then they brought some plants back with them. And this plant was licorice. Now in Pontefract, there was a large monastery and this monastery housed a lot of monks. Not all of them good, but again, we'll get into that later. But they were quite handy. And so what they did was they tended plants. So when soldiers brought back the licorice plant, they tended to it and looked after it. Now, given the sandy soil in Pontefract and also the heavy and disgusting, but very fertile effluent that flowed downstream on the river from Leeds and Bradford, this meant that the licorice grew like wildfire and it was turned into sweets. And that's what Pontefract has been known for ever since. Now, one of these monks that lived in the monastery is why I'm here talking to you today, because he just has something to do with a little council house that's now said to be the most haunted building in Europe. But doesn't everything say it's the most haunted place ever? I'm pretty sure everywhere says it's the most haunted place ever. I could claim that my bread bin's haunted and probably sell tickets for it, you never know. Anyway, 30 East Drive in Pontefract looks like any other home. It's just like a normal standard council house. You know, the ones, ones that are red brick fronted, all look exactly the same along the street, nothing untoward or different about them. 
However, behind the plain facade, there's one, number 30 East Drive, and something a little more going on behind the front door. In August of 1966, the Pritchard family moved into 30 East Drive. They were just a regular family. There was Jean, who was mother to two kids, Diane and Philip, who were 12 and 15 respectively, and also her husband, Joe. Now, almost instantly when they moved into the house, weird and creepy things started to happen. One weekend, Philip was at the home with his grandmother and Joe and Jean had taken Diane on holiday. And whilst in the kitchen, strangely, a thin layer of dust was floating in the middle of the room. It hadn't fallen from the ceiling, it hadn't come up from the floor, it was floating in the middle of the room. And even when it was wafted, it didn't move. And that was deemed to be strange, but not unexplainable. And then pools of water started to appear in the kitchen on the floor. And when they tried to mop them up or dry them, then the water just sort of balled around and they couldn't wipe it up. They called out the council to inspect what the water pools might be. And there was nothing. They found nothing under the lino, no pipes leaking. Neighbours hadn't reported anything or the drains were clear. Very odd. As time went on, more and more things started to happen in the house and the occurrences became so frequent and so often that the Pritchards were annoyed by them, they didn't like them, they reported to the council that they wanted to move, but because the house was an upgrade from where they were living previously, they decided that actually they didn't want to move home. They even had people around to try and exercise whatever it was, but it didn't work. Now, during this time, they would have things like green foam would come out of the taps and out of the plug in the bar. Lights would flick on and off, cupboards would open, plants were constantly being pulled out of their plant pots and thrown across the room. Objects flying all over the place, things levitating. They would find that their family photos had been slashed through the middle with a knife. Now, all of these things would have been livable with if the entity hadn't decided that it was going to get violent. It started to shove people down the stairs when they were walking down them. People were slapped, scratched, had bruises. When people from the local church were trying to sing hymns to get rid of it, a pair of hands appeared out of nowhere and started to conduct them whilst they sang. Ew. It also used to do things like pouring jugs of milk over people, which the kids found hilarious. But one thing Diane didn't find so funny was when one night she was walking past the bottom of the stairs, suddenly her hair stood on end and she was dragged up backwards up the stairs, kicking and screaming. And when she reached the top, she was let go. Now, when Mum Jean and Dad Joe inspected her, she had a bruise that was round her neck in the shape of a handprint all pretty scary stuff. Now the poltergeist would go through periods of activity where it was really, really active. And then other times it would be absolutely quiet for months, sometimes years. However, when it did spring back into life, it always managed to still terrify the people living in the house. But even still, Jean and Joe decided to stay there because there was no way they were gonna give up their family home. Joe, however, eventually had enough and decided that he was going to move out after one night he had a particularly nasty encounter with the ghost when he ended up being trapped inside the coal shed. The door slammed behind him and he couldn't find his way out, pushing really, really hard against the door, but it just wouldn't open. And he said that he could feel breathing inside there on his neck. And he said he didn't wanna stay there ever again after that. And I don't blame him. So Joe moved out, but Jean still wouldn't. There was no way that whatever it was was gonna get the better of her. One afternoon, Jean's neighbor popped round for a cup of tea. And as they were chatting in the kitchen, there was a sudden loud thud from upstairs and the thudding continued and continued and continued until eventually Jean decided that she would probably go and take a look. So Jean and the neighbor decided to make their way upstairs. And as they got to the top of the stairs in Jean's bedroom, she could see that her wardrobe was moving from side to side. And from inside, she could hear the faint sound of buzzing. Sounds a bit suspicious, but stay with me here. Now, as she crept towards the door, the buzzing got louder and louder and she opened the door and she was greeted by a swarm of bees that flew out and stung her. Now, Jean had been using that wardrobe every day and had used it that morning to get dressed and there were no bees in there. And then that afternoon, swarm of bees. Where do they come from? Why are they there? What are they doing? What do they want? Now in the house, there's reported to be a couple of different entities. It's not just one. Apparently there's meant to be two, possibly even more. Nobody's really sure. Now the main entity which is seen the most by people is said to be the Black Monk. Now, remember I said about that monastery? That's where he came from. In the 1400s, there was a monk who lived at the monastery and he did something to a young girl, which I'm not going to tell you about because it's absolutely hideous. But for that crime, he was executed and the gallows were said to be just a stone's throw away from 30 East Drive now. Now, you might think that that might be just enough to kind of get a bit of a haunting in a house, but that's not where it ends. The house is built on top of a closed over well and the monk's body was thrown into the well and sealed in there. 
There's also meant to be the entity of a young girl that lives in the house as well. And nobody's quite sure where she came from. Maybe she was the victim of the black monk, or maybe she just lives nearby. Maybe she's just trapped in the same place. Maybe she fell down the well. Nobody knows where she came from, but she definitely lives in the house because children are heard laughing and dolls are quite often moved in the house as well. There's definitely meant to be a ghost of a young girl in that place as well. Now, the entity of the monk goes by a couple of different names. The Pritchards called him Fred because they found that when they actually called him by his name, it stopped him from doing stuff. So if he was playing up and slamming doors or pulling drawers of cutlery out, which he was quite often doing, throwing things across the room, they would say, keep it down, Fred, and he would. So that's why they called him Fred, because it was a good way to stop him from doing things. Now, when the press got hold of the story, they decided to call the entity Mr. Nobody because they didn't know who he was or where he came from. Other people think that his actual name was Brother Michael because that's the name of the monk that did the unspeakable thing but he's also said to be reported as just a very tall black shadow so maybe he's not even a person at all maybe he is actually a demon whatever it is I don't want to find out. The surrounding area and houses are also said to be haunted as well. The next door neighbour of 30 East Drive swears blind that it is completely haunted the whole area and also the houses across the street so maybe it's not just the house, maybe it is that whole area that is haunted, but whatever it is, it seems pretty sinister, eh? In 2012, there was a film that was produced about the place, and this was said to be a pretty true account of everything that happened by the Pritchards. And as part of the promo for the film, the producer, Bill Bungay, decided that he would buy the house, as it had suddenly gone on the market. And I'm not quite sure why it had gone on the market, but I assume that Jean had either died, because she would have been quite elderly by that point, and perhaps the kids didn't want to keep the house, I can completely understand why. But the council no longer owned it, so that was it, it was on the market. And so Bill saw this, and he bought the place, in an act of very good promo for the film. And the premiere was actually held at the house, so people could watch the film in the place where all those things happened pretty scary. Now, 30 East Drive is nowadays pretty much a glorified Airbnb. You can go and stay there if you want to. It will cost you 300 quid for a night, but you can. Now, many people have done this. If you just do a quick search on YouTube, there are loads of people that have done it. So whether this place is haunted or not, pretty good money spinner for Bill. Now, whatever you think about this, I don't know whether I believe that the place is still haunted. It might not be today, or perhaps it goes in fits and starts. I don't know. I'm one of those people that's sort of middling skeptic. I've had my own experiences. If you want to hear about those, they're on my channel. But all in all, you know me, I love a good story. So whether it's haunted or not, who really cares? It's a good story, and who doesn't love one of those? Now, would you go and stay the night there? I don't know whether I would. I think maybe, mm, I don't know. Jury's still out, maybe I will one day. <laughs> if we get to a thousand subscribers before December the 31st, then maybe I'll go stay there. So if this is your first time here, then hit subscribe if you wanna see me go poop my pants and do a little reporting and investigation from there, right? I don't know if I wanna do it, so maybe don't subscribe. Anyway, thank you for joining me whilst I tell you about a rabbit hole that I've recently disappeared down. And if you did enjoy that, then as I said, please subscribe. It'd be lovely to have you here and to join the family. And please give the video a thumbs up as well. It really does help. And also if you didn't like the video, then give it a thumbs down as well it doesn't matter either way put me a comment underneath because i love talking to you guys and finding out exactly what you thought about the episodes and if you want to help out even more than just liking commenting and subscribing then um you can join me on patreon on patreon there's all sorts of different bits and bobs i send you goodies i put up polls so you can get involved in what's coming up next and you basically become a producer of the channel so if you've got just a couple of quid a month and you want to send it in my direction because it keeps my channel going and it's just the nicest when people support me because it shows me that i'm actually doing something okay and that you're enjoying it so um yeah means the world thank you thank you if you already support me and if you do want to do that then the link for patreon is in the description box below so just have a look if you're interested in checking that out but if you're not no pressure it's just nice to have you here anyway so thanks again happy halloween sorry it's not going to be that good this year i feel really bad for all of the spooky lot because this is our thing and this is our one thing of the year that we get to do and we don't get to do it this year but oh well the world is healing we'll get there Maybe. Uh, it's not quite healing, is it? Uh, <laughs> in time, hopefully. Fingers crossed. I'm not having a mental breakdown. You're having a mental breakdown. Anyway, enough from me. I'll see you all around. Happy Halloween. Love you lots. And I'll see you ghouls next time. Bye for now. <laughs>